And welcome to another episode of 72 Pin Connector. With us today we have Adam Jordan. Hello. Hey. And Tom Webster. I'm here. I think I'm here. Pretty sure I'm here. You're here. Yeah. So like like there, literally. I'm, I'm right here with, <laughs> with Irk over there. Yeah, you're literally this, there. Yeah, like like right here. Like <laughs> if Irk says something stupid, like it's okay that yeah, I completely fucked up Mass Effect Andromeda. Like I can backhand him right here. It's amazing. <laughs> So, um, we should do this all the time. For those whom are live, we apologize. We had some slight difficulties uh, with traffic and getting the logistics of this thing set up. Like all of the, this this bullshit right here. I apologize for our, our audio listeners, but there's some, some bullshit going on somewhere with us being <laughs> physically in the same room. So that said, we've got it going now. So it's, This feels weird. It feels like I'm at a, like a job interview or something. You guys are across the table. You are. You are. This is now the 72 Pin Connector Startup Podcast. Um, how is your... What's what's nice? What's cool and hipster today? Is it Haskell still, or is that old? I have no clue. Okay. So how's your Haskell? How, how have you distributed systems today? Uh, yeah. Excellent. We're, okay, we're uh, pro- good. promoting synergistic values of our client-driven strategies. Okay. Good. Good. That's Buzzwords. all we needed to hear. Yes. Uh, so how have you guys been this week? Well, let's start with you, Adam, because I think you're weak. (laughs) I've been very tired all week. I haven't even hardly played anything. I've just been zombie mode. The morning grind been getting you for work? Uh, Just sleep issues, mostly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Gotta get get you on the sleep apnea train like I'm on. Get yourself some some tubes and a mask at night. It's great. Yeah, that might help, actually. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds fantastic. It's wonderful. So, uh, Tom, how is, I mean, you're, you're not in Ohio, so how's no. your week been? Uh, a, a little, I say this every week, but a little busier than normal, just, just by a, by a tick, just by a tick. Um, so yeah, how, things, how are, things are okay. Um, very uneventful. Uh, yeah. I played some Metroid on the flight. Um, I also did other things other than play Metroid and I slept, I ate some peanuts. That was, that was mm. good. Yeah. I got a complimentary soft drink. Nice. Thank you, Delta. <laughs> Delta giving the good stuff. You you can click the annotation here because Delta paid us a lot of money. Did they, did they send that check yet? <laughs> yeah. No, no, Certainly so that no. annotation's not getting until we get the check. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Delta, as soon as you give us the check, we'll get you a logo here, right here. My entire head will be a Delta logo for the entirety of the podcast. Because certainly nobody would say anything good about Delta otherwise. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, you know, actually, Kim, I will say this. Compared to all of the other United flights I've been on, yeah. flying Delta was a fucking joy. It was hmm. it was literally one of the best. And, and that means it was still shit. I mean, it's still absolute shit because you're flying on a major airline. But it was better than United. Well, and the nice thing is you get this, because you're going a long flight, you get this TV directly in front of you that is actually free to watch whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. I watched Doctor Strange on the flight over. It was pretty cool. Nice. That's a good movie. Yeah. I was going to say, that's actually a solid movie. It is. It's a nice fun movie, and I like him. Uh, Cumberbatch, Cumberpatch, um, Cumber Dude. It's uh, Beneficial Cucumber. cucumber. Beneficial Cucumber? Yeah. I thought it was Eggs Benedict Cucumber. Eggs Benedict Benedict Cucumber. Yes, that's it. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> is now known as Sherlock Holmes. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> ah. But yes, yeah, so um, it's, it's been a fun week. Uh, as we see, we have Tom here. And um, Tom, I think you finally finished something that you've been talking about for two Dude. fucking months. So thank God. <laughs> oh, and don't, don't worry. I've got more where that came from. Oh, uh, God. I finished Dark Souls. I beat it. Uh, yes, I did summon in another player as some help because holy shit, that last fight was hard. But it's not hard in a cheap way. Uh, it's not hard in an Ornstein and Smo way because I actually felt like I was making progress during this battle. Um, nice. It's difficult as fuck. Um, after Ornstein and Smo, the rest of the game kind of flowed smoothly. I beat a bunch of bosses. I got through a bunch of areas. Got some cool gear. Um... But that last battle is just fucking killer. Uh, but after I completed it, it's done, it's finished, and now I've got more to go through in Dark Souls 2, which I did just start. Um, so it's Dark Souls 2 is a, a little weird compared to the first game. In the first game, they throw you in, you arrive, they're like, uh, yeah, uh, by the way, this thing kills you. You wouldn't know that, but you just died to it, so now you know. 
Um, and then you find some gear and like, oh yeah, by the way, if you put on that ring, like your head will turn into a sheep or, or something like that, right? Like weird, unexpected shit happens in Dark Souls. And you're like, what the fuck? It's like, yeah, didn't you know that? You should probably know that by now because the game doesn't actually tell you anything. Uh, Dark Souls 2, on the other hand, um, there's this one NPC in the main town that you get to, and he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, this thing does this, and this ring does this, and these people do this, and you should probably avoid this thing because that'll crush you. And I'm sitting there as a Dark Souls 1 player like, hold on, you're telling me how this world works? What the fuck, Dark Souls? It, 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 I wouldn't say it feels like easy mode because it doesn't force you to talk to this NPC. You actually have to talk mm -hmm. to him and he keeps giving you tips and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely not par for the course. It's not a, yeah. you have to discover it yourself. I think part of that might be, though, after the success of one from software got brought to the front forefront. Oh, absolutely. And they were kind of under probably this assumption, we have to be a little more friendly because now we actually have a, more of a following. Yeah, definitely. It feels that like a side said, effect though, of... I'm sure the NPC at the beginning with some tips is going to be greatly overshadowed by the millions of monsters peeking around every corner ready to kill you immediately. So, Oh my god. I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me tell you. So, right next to this NPC, just to get you an idea of the type of game you're getting into, um, to make sure you don't take it too softly, like, ah, oh, it's Dark Souls 2, this is going to be the easiest game in the world. Um, there's a statue that this guy is sitting next to, and it says, it, it's a, a live counter of how many deaths worldwide that this game has, has introduced. How many people, how many lives have been lost to this game. And it was around 200 million the last time I checked. Just, just a hair under 200 million. I wonder what the COD counter would be. That would be amazing to see. I mean, that number would have to that. be, like, well above a trillion. Yeah. The total deaths in a COD game. I mean, that I would know. have to be just insane. There's, um, I decided there's an option in Dark Souls 2 where you can say, hey, give me players from my local region or give me worldwide players. I'm like, oh, hmm. I'm an international kind of guy. I love all people. Give me the international people. And apparently, everyone in Japan with katanas right at the start of the game decided to line up and commit ritualistic suicide by stabbing <laughs> themselves in the stomach um, all within this one area so you get this one area and in Dark Souls when you die they, it leaves a blood stain in other players worlds where you can click on the blood stain and it shows you the last 10 seconds of their lives so what oh. these people did is all in one area there's just the floor covered in blood and there's 30 blood stains of people just killing themselves right at the beginning and right before that it just says good luck and then you see all these people killing themselves and you're like what the fuck is going on <laughs> it is one of the most harrowing beginnings to a game i have ever seen because it's not built in it's not npcs these are actual players that this is their welcome mat to dark souls congratulations awesome. we all just killed ourselves <laughs> it was so incredible good. i love that that's so welcome cool. back we're gone yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was it was wonderful uh other than that i played a little bit of length of the past on the flight uh some metroid fusion um it, yeah just normal stuff with that um mm. but I did have a chance to check out Zelda, uh, Snipper Clips, and I'm going to already, we're, we're three months into the year, I'm putting this up as the worst game of the year, Bomberman Switch. It is a fucking train wreck of a game. <laughs> it is so fucking bad. What's wrong with it? it? It's, 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 okay, it controls terribly, and that's mostly due to the fact that you're you're trying to control Bomberman through a grid of squares using analog controls that are, I would say, loosely bound, loosely coupled. It's, it's definitely not a one-to-one -one mm. So, thing. Bomberman is a game where, I mean, for those who don't know, Bomberman, isometric, you're dropping bombs, trying to kill people, up, down, left, right, movement, that's it. Um... With the joystick, it just doesn't feel right. You feel like you need to have a D-pad with that game. And because you have the joystick, you don't have the precise, it's up, it's down, it's left, it's right. As well as the movement, they tried to make it look nice and fluid. And because it's nice and fluid, you find interceptions where you think you should be clear, but you're actually hitting a block above you. So because they're trying to modernize it, they're actually making it worse. Oh. Because of the fluidity of it, you are now in a halfway position between two different blocks, so it has to block you, where previously you would just hit up and boom, you went up. 
Mm. Yeah, it, it seems like one of these games that the transition to 3D has really hurt it more than helped it. Uh, Bomberman 64 got around this by completely revamping how the battle systems uh, sort of work. They definitely were uh, pushing the 3D aspect more than the actual gameplay aspect. They didn't try to modernize a classic. They took a totally new road with it, um, which was nice. It worked for the time. It wasn't anything good or, or you know great. Uh, it's one of these bargain bin games now. Uh, but it feels like Bomberman is something that should have never left the 2D era. It never really successfully made that jump into 3D properly. Bomberman's a game that should have never been remade and just been updated with online play. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you could take Mega Bomberman on on the Genesis with the multi-tap and say, uh, yeah, you can do this online now, that's all the Bomberman anyone needs. No single player, no bullshit, just this is Bomberman. Call it done. <laughs> Speaking of single player, the worst thing about the game, in single player mode, so this <laughs> is a game where up, down, left, right is important. Yeah. They shift the map by like 30 degrees. So you're not looking at it as straight up, down, left, right fashion. You're looking at it at these weird ass angles. So when you but go why? to cut, it just feels so unnatural and you can't really get the joystick right to move. The whole time you're fighting and saying, I'm trying to go up and you just won't go up. Why and would they do that? Because you know who the publisher of this game is? You know who the developer of this game is? Konami. That's why. That's exactly why. Now, that said, we did have some last-minute news that literally hit the wire like 10 minutes ago. Um, the Nintendo Switch's Super Bomberman R will receive a significant upgrade patch. Uh, Konami says um, it's the first of many. It's a wonderful patch. It's the best thing in the world. Um, in their release, it says, uh, These improvements should refine the gameplay, control input, and character controls for online and offline play. We did not have a chance to test this out before we went live literally 10 minutes ago, uh, but it's Konami, so fuck them anyway. Yeah, so I just hope it gets better because that game, I don't know if you're experienced, Adam, with playing multiplayer Bomberman. Hmm. It is one of the fun co-op competitive experiences you can have. It's a it, wonderful yeah. game. It's right there with the other friend like Mario Kart Battle. Nice. So, it's, so if the controls were was 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 the only issue with it, the controls are kind of wonky. Yeah, because gameplay for Bomberman's been the same for twenty fucking years. Well, it's, right. it's both the controls and really the graphics because because of the switch to ah, switch uh, because of the switch to three D <laughs> um, and then focusing more on making the game. Uh, look good and animate well instead of play well they focused on the wrong thing so every little piece of the controls mixed with the animation makes for a game that it's hard to tell what's going on which in Bomberman trying to figure out the precise precision of where a bomb lays on the map is the most important thing in that game. There is nothing more important than where is this bomb in relation to my body. And because of the graphics, because of the way they structured it, that becomes more difficult than it was in 2D. I think they can still maintain the 3D graphics. They just have to make it crisp movements and not have this halfway between block stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more, they should not focus on spectacle. They should focus, really bring back the 2D sprites. Bomberman never needed to be in 3D. I think it's there just mm -hmm. because they didn't want to put out a 2D game for a new platform. But it's, yeah. it's fucking Bomberman. Just make it Bomberman. Right. And you can still make it look nice with, with really well done pixel art and then post-processing effects, well, lighting, oh, stuff yeah. like that. Well, that's actually a really big trend here in the last year or two oh, I yeah, really liked. Absolutely. Not necessarily the 8-bit, but the comeback of like the 16-bit graphics. Yeah. And then modernizing oh, yeah. the gameplay, where it looks retro, but when you go to play it, it feels super old, or super modern. Well, as oh, we've yeah. seen with stuff like Hyper Light Drifter, you can have pixel art that has spectacle built into it, because mm -hmm. Hyper Light Drifter is one of the most beautiful pixel art games I've ever played. It is gorgeous to look at uh, and it, it feels great too so you can have the best of both worlds which of mm -hmm. course in my case is a 2d game with pixel art with beautiful movement well i mean even yeah. the switch has that with uh shovel knights yeah exactly and the yeah. shovel knights um i've heard uh Vosbeck is actually um in chat here he has it and he's he raves about it oh shovel knight is really good things amazing. about shovel knight it is that's one of those so games good. that i should have already played and I've been wanting to play it, and I just have never done so. You absolutely should. <laughs> like, so, I, like, I know I'll love it. I just haven't bought it yet. Sh 
Shovel Knight is a love letter to it. It doesn't exactly emulate an NES game because if you did mm-hmm. that, it would suck. It's really right. a love letter to every video game made in 1985 and beyond. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's modern in all the right ways. It's retro in all the right ways, and it's punishingly brutally hard in perfectly fair ways. Uh, it's just a great nice. game. It's worth every penny. Yeah, I've I've heard a lot of good stuff about it. I've just never gotten to it. Um, not sure if it's something I'll really enjoy, but I've I've heard it's great. You definitely have to be a fan of the the retro style games. You know, the basically if you're a Mega Man fan, Shovel Knight is mm-hmm. the game for you. It's Mega Man mixed with Ducktales, mixed with Mario Three, mixed with a little bit of Dark Souls, believe it or not. Um, and it just it really works. <laughs> And also, so we're on the Switch. So I said two weeks ago and last week to both of you guys that don't write off the single Joy-Con controller until you try it. That this damn thing is substantially better than what you think it's going to be. I now have converted 50% of my naysayers on this podcast. Okay, <laughs> I, I should have never doubted them. If Nintendo has ever done anything right in any of their consoles, it's been the controllers. I will even the defend the Nintendo 64. Yes, that weird trident of a controller. It Ooh. felt so good. It, by modern analog stick standards, it's a little loose and it's not as precise as it should be. But for that day, for that era, it was perfect. Um, a single Joy-Con actually feels really good and believe it or not i prefer if i'm going here we go if i'm going single joy con here it goes here's the mic drop can we drop that (laughs) no we're not dropping my mic okay don't damn Uh, so (laughs) i have to edit this later tom (laughs) here's the here's the theoretical mic drop if i'm having to use a single joy con i absolutely prefer the right side the the what? center the middle Why? the middle analog stick because the opposite of that and I I wasn't even considering it the opposite of having the the analog stick in the center is having mm-hmm. the buttons in the center which is way way weirder oh, to use that's a good point but also keep in mind because of the size of the Joy-Con the middle is the depth to normally get to the buttons on a standard controller I did not realize the Switch was so tiny. It is a tiny system. Like, it's it's smaller than a Nexus 7 tablet. I was expecting something that was, you know, iPad mini or, or Nexus 7 style. You know, something something about this big. But it's it's this teeny little thing. And I, I get why people complain about the screen. It's a beautiful screen, but it is a small screen. And you see, to me, in the handheld configuration, I don't need a Nexus 7. It's perfect. I can hold this thing at arm's length, and I got long arms, and I can play this thing visibly perfect. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about a mobile console is just stick your face closer to it. (laughs) (laughs) If you want the screen to be bigger, put it closer to your eyes. The letters are too small. Well, get your eyeballs in there. No, but the the small screen probably helps with the lower resolution, because if the screen was bigger at that resolution, it it would look way worse, I bet. It does. Exactly. It's like 480 on a screen that's 5 inches looks perfect. You put it on a 60-inch, and you feel you're going to poke your eye out on jagged corners on fucking pixels. Right. There's one thing I was bitching about with the Switch, um, which is the centerpiece, the charging component for the Joy-Cons being, what is it, 30 bucks to buy that stupid middle piece that literally does nothing except gives you ports. And charge. And, and charge. Um, <clears throat> you don't need it. You absolutely don't need it. I'm a complete convert at this point. If I could take my 360 controller and break it in half and use each individual piece in my hands, I would so (laughs) do that. I didn't even realize it. So I was sitting on Urk's couch. I was playing Zelda, and I wasn't, like, holding it like this, right? Because in Dark Souls mode, I'm sitting there with my controller gripped close to my chest. I'm freaking out. And in Zelda, like... I'm lounging, I'm leaning back, I'm chill, I've got a, an arm on an armrest, another like is sitting on my fat gut, and I'm just, <laughs> I'm having the time of my life exploring the hills of Hyrule in the most comfy gaming position I have ever been in in my entire life. <laughs> I am a complete convert of the split controller. It is wonderful. It takes the... I bet you... <clears throat> I bet you can make that happen if you just have two 360 controllers. Oh, I'm sure you could beat Domino. In some way. Domino with Goldeneye. Have, did you guys ever play Domino mode in no. Goldeneye? Oh, my God. Okay. We're getting retro right now. Uh, so the Domino control style, 
was you could have two controllers, N64 controllers, playing GoldenEye or Perfect Dark in your hands and have dual analog control with those. And that's how I used to play GoldenEye, is you would hmm. use two controllers at the same time to play. That would actually make it playable today because I don't know if anyone yeah, in the audience well. has done this. Going back to GoldenEye right now, it is possibly one of the most unplayable games on the 64. It's bad. Yeah. It's bad today. Turok, as a shooter, plays better than GoldenEye now. See, and, as somebody yeah, who definitely. didn't play the N64 much when it was out, I, at the time, thought GoldenEye controlled it like shit. Like, I did not think it was very fun to play. Well, <laughs> comparatively, for anything on a console at the time, like, if you came from the Quake era or the Doom era of gaming, of course GoldenEye controlled like shit. C comparatively. Unless you played Doom on the SNES. Unless you played Doom on the SNES, which was pretty shitty. Because, well, because, I mean, mouse key... Shooter configurations for PC has been the same for two decades. The dual mm -hmm. or the twin stick shooter didn't come around to the PS2 Xbox era. Right. Uh, no, no. Twin stick shooter. Well, sorry, I don't mean twin stick. I mean, uh, well, for, tw first person shooter, not right. isometric. No, but that was in the PlayStation with Medal of Honor. But it wasn't a required. You could. Yes, that's true. That's true. It wasn't a required staple because, because uh, they still built for the analog less control. Yes, because the PS1 actually shipped without dual shocks and that right. wasn't standard till the two. Yeah. So I Getting mean retro up in here. But yes. <laughs> um the controllers for the Switch feel like the Wii done right. Because you don't have that fucking tether of the nunchuck. Yeah. And without that tether you can be purely comfortable. The the big complaint I have, and this is so weird to me because Nintendo has gotten this right so so often, they totally fucked it up here, is there is no D-pad. And and I get why they didn't do it, because they needed the sideways controller to function like buttons, but still, if you're using two of them at the same time, to be directional. Um, so instead of having a legit D-pad, they've got four different buttons for the different directions. But when you're doing stuff like, you know, on a D-pad, you would slide in from, you know, the bottom to the right control, and it would feel really natural. You can't do that with the Switch. The one thing the Switch allows for that I can see happening is you can buy a spe I can see them letting you buy a specialized left Joy-Con that instead of the button configuration has a D-pad. That's true. Because with this slide principle, you can pair anything you want. So I can see them starting to build optional controllers that you could sub in and out. Like if you don't want to write thumbstick and you want to write D-pad, I can see them making one for that and stuff like that nature. Yeah. I can't wait to see like the 360 or the, was it the 360 Elite controller or was it the Xbox One Elite controller? The Xbox One Elite. Yeah, where, where you can take out pieces and flip them. I could see Nintendo releasing a gamut of different controller options. That said, when they release the one that everyone wants, they're going to make six of them and you're never going to see them again. You mean the Pro? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> By the way, the, the weird like almost controller that they released, which is basically a, a Joy-Con single piece with some wings on it so you can hold it like a like a 360 controller. You don't need it. I know it comes with the system. You're not paying any extra for it, but I found it kind of, I wouldn't say limiting, but less comfy than just using the Joy-Cons individually. I, I cannot even explain how comfy using a split controller is. It has changed my life. I think <laughs> in something like an actual first-person shooter, though, having that controller would be nice because right. you would have instances where you may want to be light on your finger, so you don't want to be clutching. You yeah. want to be able to use your palm yeah. pressure. The, yeah. the one thing we didn't try was that. seductively milking cows as we, as we stared deeply into each other's eyes. Well, that's because I'm not paying 50 bucks for an abomination of a game. Right, right. But... Also, I mean... Should we, we talk snipper clips? We should probably yes. talk snipper clips. So, the... Um, this should not be this much fun. The golden <laughs> thing... So, Zelda aside, everyone know, knew Zelda was going to be great. There was another great launch title. Snipper Clips is a throwback to couch co-op in a very, very enjoyable way. It is the stupidest game I have ever played, and I have never had so much fun with something that shouldn't have been that much fun. So, we've talked about this before in the past, but it was just me at this time. And now I think Tom helps bring in a different perspective where 
this game, for those who missed it, it's a 2D, your two, two players, each a shape, and your bodies overlap. And when you decide to cut, you cut the opponent or your other player. And the objective is to get yourselves into shapes to help solve these problems. Whether it be, hey, collectively make this shape, or, hey, we're going to have a basketball fall from the ceiling, catch it, and get it in that basket that you can't reach on your own. It, it sounds weird, and, and we might be able to do some streaming later of snipper clips eventually one day, so you can actually get an idea of how it works. But the, mm-hmm. the lesson I took away from this game, which Dark Souls has been a transformative religious experience for me. I, I know patience, I know inner peace, I know what it's like to be poisoned in the depths of Blight Town and see no light at the end of the tunnel. But finally, It took you two here, months, I hope you learned that. Yeah, I, I hope, I hope. Um, it'll wear off, don't worry. Uh, but what Snipper Clips has taught me is that Tom being a prick is totally the solution to any problem you could face. Okay, we were playing this game, and the only thing I would do is I would run up to Irk's little paper character, and I would just snip the shit out of him, just taking off pieces of his block man. And somehow, it would create the perfect shape for him to solve the puzzle. It was amazing. The only thing I've learned from Snipper Clips is being a dick works. In all cases. Bar none. That's the end of the lesson. Cases. Just be a Life complete lessons. prick. Yep. That's it. <laughs> I should write a book. Play Dark Souls. Play Snipper Clips. That's all you need to know is have patience and be a prick. Yeah. Tom's life lessons. Yeah. And you got the prick thing down. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then now that I'm not the only one and also have a different perspective, Zelda Breath of the Wild. Yes. I come into this game as a guy who has played Zelda sparingly. I'm familiar with the franchise. I've played some of the stables, but I mean, it's I'm take it or leave it. Where Tom over here... Super fan. Played every title, done all that fun bullshit, but he's finally got hands on Breath of the Wild as well. Not as long, but he's he's got some good time on it now. And so what was your takeaway as someone who is a lifelong Zelda guy? The one thing I really feared from Breath of the Wild is is the same thing I've seen. Uh, I saw it in Skyrim a lot, definitely in Oblivion. Uh, and it was hugely prevalent in Skyward Sword, which is, um, hey, it's a Nintendo game. We're going to make this easy and not as punishing. But I decided, all right, cool. There's a cliff. I'm going to paraglide into like this river basin. And there's some lizard dudes. I'm going to kick their ass. Fuck them. And the thing I realized is this Zelda game is not afraid to kick your ass and hand it to you on a silver platter and be like, dude, bro, you jumped in the middle of three dudes and they fucked you up. You deserve now every you minute of it. And now every you're dead. Every fucking minute. Now you're dead. Now I'm dead. <laughs> um, and it was really enjoyable getting my ass kicked in a Zelda game because for so long that series has been without a really good challenging fuck you streak the first Zelda (laughs) game was like boom fuck you the second Zelda game was like boom super fuck you bitch fuck your whole family (laughs) fuck your mom I mean Zelda 2 was unflinchingly punishing it is one of the hardest games I have ever played. And and unfortunately, it's the one I started with as a kid. So I came into Zelda with the Dark Souls Zelda. And, and then and then you get to Link to the Past, which is, uh, you know, definitely difficult, but not as difficult. And then you get into, into Ocarina, and it's they're good games. They just get easier over time. And Skyward Sword was, hey, we're going to show you this puzzle, and you should probably try to solve it. Oh, it's been 35 seconds. By the way, here's the solution. Fuck <laughs> off, Skyward Sword. Uh, but yeah, Breath yeah. of the Wild doesn't have that. There's there's no there's no side character yelling at you. There's no hey listen. There's the if you approach this wrong, uh, go fuck yourself. Which is great. I, that's not a negative yeah. at all. Um, there's also the ability uh, to approach things differently. It's not like if you approach this from any other direction except this one prescribed path, you're going to fail. This is um, you know if. If you don't think things through, you're going to fail. Um, so one thing I, I did, which was cool, is I accidentally, because was, the controls in this are weird and off-putting mm. and not at all what I was expecting from playing previous Zelda titles. 
Uh, and actually, it's kind of a negative in my opinion. They did change a whole lot of the controls to do different things than you would expect coming from a long time Zelda perspective. It's going to take some getting used to. Um, I see yeah. why they did it, but I don't agree with you know how they did it. Um, but one thing I did is I was going up against some enemies, um, and I decided to chuck a bomb at this dude's face. And I totally missed it. Sailed clear over him. But it <laughs> rolled down the hill past his body. I'm like, oh my god, I can do it, because all your bombs are remote detonate. And I hit the remote detonate and blew him the fuck up. And it's nice. all thanks to this beautiful <laughs> physics engine that's just incredible. Um, there were these metal boxes. I was like, I wonder if I could break them. So I hit them with my sword. Yeah, that didn't do anything. But you've got this magnet ability. And I'm, I'm not spoiling anything, because these are items you get way early on in Breath of the Wild. They've been in every trailer. The, the cool, spoilery bits is how you use them together. But I wanted to break this box. So, you know, I picked it up. I threw it against the wall. It just bounced off. I'm like, what if I just fucking chucked it? So I took it, and I threw it in the air, and this thing sailed, and I just watched it like, ah, oh, I probably shouldn't have it land on me. Um, and it did, and I almost died, but I didn't die, and the box broke, which was what? great. It was great. If, as long as you throw things <laughs> properly, they will shatter. That doesn't seem like very uh, consistent physics. Uh, it actually is. It, it feels great. Uh, everything works the way it should. Um, just for kicks, I lit a field on fire. It's a beautiful, pristine, flowing field of wonderful grass and lots of life. And I just burnt it the fuck down, man. It was <laughs> fucking great. That sounds like something you would do. Oh, it was so much fun. Um, the one thing that you didn't get to experience that's really, really cool about this game is the lightning storms. It's cool, but it's obnoxious. So I hear about that. If you are wearing metal and you're in an open field, you're going to get hit, you're going to fucking die. So Ooh. if there's a storm running in, you have to switch out. You have to go to wood. You have to go to non-equipped. You have to do something. Otherwise, mm. you are just going to get just lit the fuck up. But that also goes for enemies. I've been up on this hill camping out enemies about to attack, and then all of a sudden, boom, lightning strikes, kills one of them. There's, uh, I saw Nintendo released uh, three 10 minute, they're, I would almost call them making of trailers because they don't quite reach that pinnacle of like a full making of documentary like they did with uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution or Human Evolution, uh, the first one in the series. Um, or or the, the Doom making of stuff, which was really excellent. Um, they're yes, pretty short. Was. But. Um, in the trailer, they explained one of these lightning storms, and they showed uh, a person playing where they were holding a metal sword, and this thing starts sparking if lightning is about to hit you. And the dude chucks the sword at an enemy, and it's still sparking, it's still being targeted by the lightning, and it hits the enemy. So he not only takes damage from getting hit with a sword, it also strikes lightning at that moment, electrocuting him and killing him. The system's dynamics, the way everything just interacts in this world is incredible. Also in the nice. trailer, they showed the dude lighting grass on fire and then using the updraft of the, the giant bonfire in the field he just caused to propel himself with the paraglider into the air where he could <laughs> airdrop bombs onto enemies. Holy That's awesome. shit, this game. <laughs> they, uh, you can't drop bombs in the air, so I think they probably removed Oh, that. they probably just dropped and then threw them all Yeah. Out. Okay. But, yeah. um... Still. Still. That's <laughs> fucking awesome. The game sounds really good. I really want to play that. It's it's super super fucking good. Um, though Tom experienced a little bit of what I had after ridiculing me, saying that twenty buttons in the game are bound to throw your fucking weapon in the pond. Oh my god! Soon <laughs> as he did it for the first time, he did it for five times in a row while trying to shoot his bow. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, you see Tom just like, okay, I'm going to fight, going to fight, go to pull out my bow. You see him just cock his arm back, and boom, there goes his sword. <laughs> now, now I'm swordless. I was making fun of him for this endlessly because I'm like, uh, in my head, there has never been a Nintendo game with piss poor controls, and they're not that bad in Breath of the Wild, but they're still not good. I really wish you could you could totally remap everything in this game because I would, uh, or at least change change the bindings. In every other Zelda game, when you're holding mm -hmm. a bomb, when you're holding an object, when you're running in your id motion, you press A. What should happen? 
In every other Zelda game, you chuck the thing. Whatever you're holding, you just chuck it forward. And that's how it should be. No, but that requires you to run to throw, which is bullshit. You can throw without running. Yeah, I know that. And I know it doesn't make sense, but that's how I no, 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 it, it to You work. just said it. It doesn't make sense. So why do it? <laughs> because it's how... So you uh, want this they, to be a 2D game where you're just going around? Because yeah. that's how it's been. And I, I know I know the entire point of this Zelda game is to break conventions, is to do things the way they should be and not how they've always been. But when it mm. comes to controls, I almost feel like they could break that rule. They could break their design pattern of, we're going to break conventions because they don't make sense. It's, it's control. So every time I would go to throw a bomb, I'd be running and drop it at my feet. Because that's what the A button does. It doesn't throw. It just drops shit right in place. So how do you want to drop a bomb if you're running? Stop and then press the A button. I, I know it and doesn't make clunky. sense. I know it's worse, but it doesn't feel right. I want a slider. So I want a thing like that says the issue I'm here isn't the game. The issue here is you. I know, but I, I want <laughs> I really want I know, but I'm still right. <laughs> I completely agree with you. But no, I, I, I want I an that, option though. where it says, you know, give me the proper control scheme of how this game should be played and how we really want you to play it in the right way to do things. Or, hey, old ass Zelda person, we're going to give you your shitty fucking controls. It can even be labeled shitty fucking controls. I'd be like, yes, thank God, please. <laughs> and what he doesn't tell you is at the very bottom, it tells you the entire time you're holding that bomb, which one throws uh -huh. and what one drops. Oh, it lets me know. There, There is nothing in this that is not my fault. Everything, every time I fucked up or threw a sword or dropped a bomb at my own feet or blew myself the mm -hmm. fuck up, because that happened <laughs> a lot, uh, was 100% my fault. Yeah. But for the love of God, give me the fucked up control scheme option. I want to play this like Wind Waker. Also, I'd like to see more games have rebindable buttons anyway. I'm pretty sure that one does, because there is a controls yeah. options in the settings. I would have to look. Okay. I'll have to look. Because I, I really I really want fucked up controls. I want the bad controls. <laughs> Give them to me, Nintendo. <laughs> I know it's not right. I know it'll kill me in the end. I know I'm going to get, like, hand cancer or whatever bad controls give you. But I just hand want cancer. it. I need it. It's an addiction. You'll be crippled for life <laughs> because of your terrible ass controls. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, Dark Souls and Zelda has this problem, too, where you have to claw grip. If you want to run... And change the, the camera at the same time and do something else. You have to claw grip. In in Dark Souls, uh -huh. I've gotten so used to doing the gnarled hand on the controller thing. I'm going to have arthritis by 35. <laughs> Garen fucking teed. And Zelda's got that same issue. You know you're getting hardcore into something when you play with claw grip. Oh my god, that's the only way I play Dark Souls. Because I have to run and I have to change the camera so I know what shit's going to jump out and swoosh me. Mm. Yeah. Yes, smushing. It happens. I haven't had to do claw. I've managed to no, run and would, then just go off never. of the camera I have to know where I need to go. Yeah, I, I would never I claw. I don't do that. that. I claw. Nope. I claw hard. Nope, 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 nope. nope. I've clawed for some games like Halo. I've clawed a little bit, but that was for like jumping, shooting, doing some weird combinations. Every time but, I do it, though, I just think to myself, "Get you gadget." No, no. Get out of no. here. And with that, fuck you, you're revoked. Uh, Adam, um, <laughs> yeah. since his privileges are now gone, what have you been playing this week? Uh, Rocket League, as that may be of surprise to you. Do I you play, play Rocket, League? Rocket League? I do sometimes. Okay. Too much. Did you get back into any but, of that uh, um, Resident Evil? Yes, I did, actually. I was about to bring that up. I haven't played it a lot, though. Like I haven't played much of anything this week, so I didn't get much further than I was last week. But I did get a little bit further, and I got to a really cool boss fight. Oh, like, really? this is a... I don't want to say Silent Hill-esque, but it's definitely more into the less humanoid kind of enemy. But humanoid enough to make it kind of disturbing, you know what I mean? Oh, okay. So, Uncanny Valley type shit. Yeah. And this thing, like, you know, runs around on the walls and ceiling. Oh. On all fours. And it's pretty creepy. It's hmm. it's cool. Pl playing that part in VR would have been terrifying. Oh my god, I can't wait. I but, think um, playing every part of this game in VR yeah. sounds like it would be terrifying. I'm going to buy some Depends. Yeah. Invest but, in Depends but, stock. That is a 72-pin <laughs> connector stock tip right now. Buy Depends but, stock. Yes, do it. Um, but I played through it. I played through that boss fight three times and died 
And then I, then I was just like, all right, I'll try this again some other day. So the game is pretty difficult, actually, at parts. Is it enough of a game to keep you caught, even if you like get mercilessly slaughtered a few times, or is this a game that you will find yourself getting bounced off of? It, I don't think it's hard enough to get stuck enough to be that frustrated with it, but it is hard enough that you're probably going to die. Yeah, it's the, not Dark Souls level. You will repeatedly, die. but you, yeah, will die. you will die. Sometimes. Well, there's the whole setup thing where if you die, that's fine. It's expected. But what do you have mm-hmm. to do to get back to where you died? Uh, that actually is something that really bothers me in games is having to backtrack through something. Um, you've, you've got save points like the old Resident Evil games. So, you know, if you mess up and you don't save at the right spot, it could cause you some trouble. But like right before a boss fight, it's going to auto save. So the most you're going to walk around a couple of rooms picking up the same items each time you die you, and you might fight. not like you might not like dark souls because yeah. they they never at least in dark souls one there is never mm-hmm. a bonfire before a big boss fight they will yeah. make you retread that path each and every yeah. time that was one of the things that turned me off of it initially dark you, souls, you gotta get good is. you gotta get yeah. good <laughs> i just gotta get good. there's parts not good. there's parts of that that don't bother me uh-huh. but like um in neo i'm stuck at a spot where I have to dredge fairly far and then mm-hmm. get to a boss fight. And this boss is really fucking hard. Yeah. And it got to the point where I almost had her dead. I had her down within probably a tenth of her health. She mm-hmm. kills me and I'm just like, fuck it, I'm done, I'm out, drop the controller, <laughs> fuck this shit, <laughs> fuck this noise, fuck this life, I'm done. Yeah. So um, I haven't touched it because uh, Horizon came out and it's made me nice and happy. So uh, fuck Neo, there I'll be go. getting back to that soon though. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, we'll make you a Dark Souls convert yet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I like those style. I Like I said, I'm liking Neo. It's just that part got super frustrating. I put it down for a little bit. I got into some Stardew Valley, and then Horizon hit, and after Horizon, Zelda's hit. So, Is there... I, I really want like a Dark Souls-esque farming game. Like, you mix Dark Souls and Harvest Moon, where you've got to really, really watch your profit margins, and if not, your uncle's farm goes under and everyone you love dies, or something like that. That'd be great. That sounds terrible. That sounds like taking Farm Simulator and then adding an economy. I'd I'd play it. (laughs) I'd hate it, but I'd play it. You're a terrible human being. I know. But, so the... um, boss fight though is there any like new stuff that it brought in or is it just okay here's a new boss it's really fucked up um it's it doesn't really bring in much new i mean it's it's a harder boss fight um every enemy is a bullet sponge in resident evil oh really that's which it should be because it's always been that way but uh i put a lot of shots at this enemy and I still died <laughs> so but it's one of those it has a weak point you know you shoot the weak point a bunch of times you know it flees away for a second and then you gotta catch it at a vulnerable point again and shoot the weak point and do that repeatedly uh, some of the boss fights maybe would kind of drag out if you're impatient but I think it adds kind of to the intensity of it so is it the thing where uh, the boss fight itself isn't actually hard it's a test of patience and if you break your patience you get brutalized no it's hard okay okay the actual execution of it is kind of hard at points because um i've hit some spots in zelda where it's like this isn't hard Mm -hmm. i can beat this super easy but i'm got to dedicate time like i watched gina she got into a really really fucking difficult shrine Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things where there's a solution. We can, she can beat this, and she did. Mm-hmm. It just takes for fucking ever. Yeah, I mean, we're talking 45 minutes for a shrine. Jesus. Oh, wow. But yeah, it's, it's one of those. Bubble. Also, the controls aren't like. It doesn't play like a Call of Duty shooter. You know, it's it's a little slower. You know, every time you reload, that takes time. Every time you switch a weapon, it takes time. If you want to use a health thing, that takes time. Uh, you don't run super fast, so all of that kind of affects that as well. They they maintain the horror aesthetic, is what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely, definitely. You don't feel too powerful at all, ever, so far. So at this point in the game, are you still in 
countering new types of enemies outside of bosses because obviously bosses will be improved and such um i'm still not even that far into the game but it's kind of like you've got the molded which is the the creatures the the non-human enemies um and i think there's a couple different types of those but i've only encountered really one or two they're kind of they're basically the same every time and then uh bosses slash other enemy encounters are all like the family that has you kidnapped yeah that game i I was just flipping through a magazine at the airport and i was looking up Mm -hmm. saw some screenshots and i'm just like god this just looks creepy and it yeah it looks creepy because they do that beautiful thing of make it look real and real fucked up yeah so very very much how silent hill built their creatures the, mm-hmm. the whole ethos behind all the creatures in Silent Hill was if the designers created something and showed it to someone, the reaction had to be something along the lines of, oh, Jesus, what the fuck is that? Because if you recognize it as anything, terrestrial even, it wasn't grotesque or creepy enough. We well, see, I'm going on a different way where I think things are creepier if you know what it is. If you know what it is That's resembling true. and then there is just something something wrong about with it. it. Yes. Yeah. So your uncanny valley area. Yes, I think that is where horror games hit like their peak is this is extremely relatable except for the slight nature that fucks it all up. And that's mm-hmm. what gives it that edge of, oh, fuck, this is weird. In Silent Hill 4, there's an, a part in that game where there was a giant head in a hallway yeah. of a woman. And, like, she was covered in, like, cobwebs or something. And she looked almost, like, ghostly pale, like, really fucked up. And her, her eyes were kind of fucked up. But one eye kept twitching rapidly and would follow you around the room as it was twitching. It was the weirdest fucking thing I've ever seen. Not necessarily like typical horror movie gore scary, but just mm-hmm. what the fuck? Which is it's kind of you know part of the course in Silent Hill. Yeah. Yeah, I've never actually played much Silent Hill. Really, I've, I've seen a lot of it, and I know it's creepy as shit with like the pyramids, heads, and stuff. But mm-hmm. it's never been something I've really done a whole lot of. Two is really good. Three is really good. Four, yeah, it's not bad. Uh, everything else, yeah, you could probably skip it safely. Yeah. Yeah, and now you know since there is none and probably will never be more, so. Yeah. <laughs> so what have you been playing that's not Silent Hill? Obviously. Um, but the only thing I've, I won't touch on anything you've hit, but I have played one other thing, and that is uh, Fast RMX on the Switch. <clears throat> so the Switch is kind of light on games. And this is... The device is jo- it's just nice. You want to do stuff on it. And I need a nice palette cleanse from Zelda. So the solution to me was Fast RMX. This is a remake of something that I guess was on the Wii U. But I never... I wasn't there, so I didn't know of it. But this is like no a... It's, it's okay. It's a version of F-Zero X or F-Zero mixed with Ikaruga. Which I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. It is a um, top-down airplane shooters in the vein of 1942. uh, Where enemies would shoot certain colors. And you could switch the color of your plane live to be able to dodge these shots and absorb these shots. This game has boosts on the ground that you have to have the right engine trail color to hit. And then it'll boost you. The uh, thing you can do is you switch back and forth. So you'll come across a yellow boost, you'll hit it. And all of a sudden you see a blue one up, so you have to switch and then hit it. Meanwhile, you have all these boost pads on the ground you have to pick up, like an F-0X. Okay. Then you hit the boost pads and you go. These are all ships like F-0X. The levels are very twisty, turny, windy, incredibly fast. You'll get in half pipes like F-0 and all that, all that fun stuff like it. To the point where there is a pro circuit where your boost meter is your health meter. Just like F-Zero-X, where you run out of boost, you hit a wall, you die. So um, it's a it's a solid game. Um, the Switch, it's a little light on titles for 20 bucks. It's more than worth $20 if you like F-Zero. Um, but yeah, it was, it's a good time. Adding to Switch list. 
Yeah, you, I mean, it's <laughs> oh, and there's not a whole lot to add right well, now. Though, yeah. just mm-hmm. today, the binding of Isaac dropped. Yeah, so, that's always worth it. I think I would absolutely love to have that game mobile. I think I'm gonna have to. Um, I, I have been convinced I will be buying a Switch as soon as I can find one. I'm gonna get Binding of Isaac. I'm gonna get Fast RMX. I'm gonna get Snipper Clips, uh, and and I'm definitely getting Zelda. I'm definitely um, thinking about the Binding of Isaac. <clears throat> It's just rough because, you know, I've already put 200 hours on two different just, versions yeah. of Binding of Isaac. Yeah. Tiny bit of time. <laughs> but It'd be cool if you could transfer your save. Yes, that That'd would be, be nice. amazing. But the Switch currently doesn't offer cloud saves. Hoping when they start to fully roll out their online that they'll institute cloud saves. Because right now, had Tom started his own Zelda save, he'd have to start from scratch once he got his own game. You yep. cannot transfer saves to SD cards. One mm. one thing I do want to talk about with the Switch is it's first a great thing. There's a dedicated screenshot button on one of the Joy Cons. You just hit the button and it takes a screenshot instantly. I love this. This is probably one of my favoriteest, stupidest things on the Switch because it is absolutely unnecessary. Completely unnecessary, but it's so great. And I can, anytime I wanted to take a picture of something dumb, like me blowing myself up for the 19th time in Zelda when <laughs> I pressed A and when I should have pressed R and then I hit L and then I blew up, I could press that screenshot button and remember the time that I totally fucked up forever. I could even post it to Twitter and everyone can know how bad I suck at playing Breath of the Wild. <laughs> and it includes it automatically with the hashtag Nintendo Switch hashtag game. Hashtag Tom sucks. So, um, you know, you can get all trendy with all those hashtags on oh, that yeah. Twitter. I want hashtag, mm. hashtag. But, I want uh, some hash browns. Oh, man, that sounds good. But the uh, the Switch, the OS itself, the, the functionality built into the game console, at best, is beta quality. You can tell they are working on a lot. You can tell it's going to be great. But right now, completely unfinished. Um, there is so much missing that should be there, that could be there. Nintendo is beta testing their console operating system on its users. I don't agree with that. This is a very lightweight. It doesn't have a lot on the splash, but it's very lightweight. It does what it needs to. It's very snappy. It's honestly, I don't want them to add much. I think it's very good the way it is. All they need to do is add options to be able to get into game library. So they don't have to put a lot of stuff at you at first and yeah. actually build a shop function because the shop is trash. The shop is awful. But I, I will agree with that. Um, if you've ever used you know, the Wii or the Wii U, you know these things, uh, those, those consoles were stupid slow to do literally anything. Like you avoided the settings menu because it took so long to change anything on them um, with you know, basically two second loading pauses between every click. Uh, the Switch doesn't have that issue. It feels faster than my phone. It was stupid snappy, and it operated exactly how it should. Uh, it felt wonderful to use. Um, yeah, I think I think that's all the the yelling I have about the Switch so far. Um, should we should we go into some gaming news? I know we've got a a smattering of stories this week. Yeah, we can uh, get into a little bit. Um, one interesting one right off the bat. Last week, we uh, talked about the new streaming service from Microsoft that they're going to be instituting. Well, Sony, not to be outdone, said, you know what? We're going to add PS4 support to PS Now. And this is really big for you guys who don't have PS4s because this means that you can stream on your PC games such as Horizon Zero Dawn, potentially, or Neo, or Bloodborne. Oh my god, if I could pay a streaming service and play Bloodborne, that's the only reason yes. I want a PS4. Maybe Horizon Zero Blood- Dawn. I want to play Bloodborne so much. So much more than <clears> I wanted <throat> to play Dark Souls. It looks like it's, so good. The art good. style is just so much better for me. So in case uh, you're unaware, so Dark Souls is this typical Western fantasy, swords and sorcery place. Bloodborne is Victorian England with guns and swords. It is so cool. It is it is gothic in all the right ways and so wonderfully Victorian English. It is awesome. Uh, it is basically everything on the planet Earth that my wife loves mixed with Dark Souls. I feel like this could be a real bonding experience. If you're out there listening, we need to buy a PS4. 
or <laughs> or get the streaming service if Bloodborne comes to it. So that's that. Um, that would be really nice because that also gives people like, um, wow, I just blanked. Um, on PC, you'll have the ability potentially to stream the new Red Dead Dead if they put that on the streaming service. That'd be nice. We'll see what they do there. That would be nice. Some things on streaming service they require you to pay. I'm sure if that was to come that way, mm-hmm. you would have to. Yeah. Um, That's fine. <coughs> the, for, for this type of service, uh, it's price is no object. This is really nice. Well, no, they'd say you pay for the streaming and certain games you have to pay for yeah, the that, game. That'd be okay. Oh, yeah. So it's like a double pay system. But, for, for some games, that'd be okay. Um, I don't care. Let me play Red Dead Redemption. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a ton, a ton of PC guys. Take my money. A ton, Tell me how much you need. A ton of PC guys are like, you've already neglected us way too fucking much. Yes. Let us play the fucking game. Yes. <laughs> um, New Quake is going to be uh, free to play. Its software came out and said that. So that'll be interesting to see. They're doing kind of a um, Super Monday Night Combat slash League of Legends where there'll be certain heroes that are free. You can earn in-game currency to unlock them permanently, or you can buy in-game currency to unlock them. But all items and stuff is going to be ground lo- or level playing field. The core person that will be free is going to be the general Quake dude. I don't, I don't know how, <clears throat> how I feel about this. I mean, aside from the fact that Quake hasn't been relevant since Quake 3, um, Quake doing kind of a MOBA-ish, Overwatch-ish style game. It doesn't... I don't think it really fits. We'll have to see how it all shakes out, but I'm not, you know, hyped for this in any any matter. It may not even play really in the Overwatch realm. Just because there's different classes doesn't mean it's going to turn into a class-based shooter. Yeah, I'd hope not. Right. We'll, we'll have to see. Because, I mean, Mag had different classes, but Mag did not feel anything like a class-based shooter. But what will it turn into then, right? If, if you've got all these classes and all these items and you can pay for stuff, why would I want to pay for something that doesn't make any difference in my game at all? Well, it could be small little quirks like you'd like yeah, playing this yeah. guy a little more than others. But there's, I'm just saying like class-based systems is very much when you're the sniper in TF2, you can't pick up a medic's gun. You can't pick up the heavy machine gun. Right. And Quake is not that type of game. It'd be more of maybe a starting package. Or this player jumps higher, this player runs faster. It, it will, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll also be interesting to see if they avoid the Monday Night Combat problem where the in game meta rapidly shifts from week to week. Because in, in some, you'll have you know a, a healer heavy meta. And this was when the game was still live. And, and then you'll get to the next week, and all of a sudden, all the healer people have moved on because they haven't bought the healer they just move on to the new hero that's now free and and then it becomes a gank fest and every game gets stupid annoying and then it becomes a heal fest and every game gets stupid long and but you see that has to really balance that that's also because that's a very class-based game i don't see this being class-based that way i hope not we'll have to see um, there is some big rocket league news and i think adam is best suited to um (laughs) bring this to us yeah, I'll just do a quick overview. Um, in usual fashion, uh, all the major season changes. So this is going to be the start of season four, the competitive season four. Uh, that always comes with you know, a new game mode, a bunch of updates and stuff. So the game mode is called Drop Shot. Um, it's kind of like the old game Breakout meets Rocket League. So um, the, the floor is made up of all these uh, hexagonal panels. And when the ball hits one, it like marks it and depending on how hard it hits if you hit it again it'll break through and that leaves a hole in the floor and that's where you need to score to get your points so yeah I think it sounds like a lot of fun it looks it sounds kind of cool it looks really really interesting um the visually it looks fun the fact you mm-hmm. don't fall through the floor is also a really good thing yeah yeah <laughs> in other words that would turn into a just a shit fest yeah yeah, but that'll be a that'll be a cool fun mode to play. Um, it comes with a new map that's that mode is played on, um, a new series of crates. Uh, there's a new car in the crates. It looks kind of like a futuristic Lamborghini. Um, it looks pretty good. But yeah, competitive season four, uh, the new ranking system, which is I think we talked about that a couple of episodes ago when they announced it. Yeah, um, they're they're getting rid of the the challenger, the rising star, or whatever, and they're going to the bronze silver gold platinum and then the champion well and then diamond and then champions the diamond rack, and the champion. there's actually right, going right, right. To, not platinum 
they said that there's too much there's disparity or despair G, uh, there's too much difference between Words. gold ranks <laughs> yeah. yeah so um they're actually breaking these out further so that you have more uh, granularity in the ranks yeah That'll and hold they're nice. working on some matchmaking stuff to improve that some just just a lot of cool stuff they're adding a button on the front page that says you know esports are live so people actually know when the rlcs is broadcasted and stuff so sweet uh, a lot of little changes and big changes and cool stuff. So looking forward to it. That they clearly is March twenty second. So that's pretty soon. I think that's what Wednesday. Yes, and that uh, will yeah. mark the end of season three. By the way, so anyone rushing yes. to get blue still, yes, you have less than a week to get blue or purple or gold or silver or anything. Yeah. So if you miss your chance, you don't get your wheels. My get only those issue six season rewards. My only issue with the the new game mode is I will absolutely suck at it because I'm oh, definitely yeah. not that good. That said, I suck at every Rocket League game mode, so it kind of <laughs> follows the trend. That's what I was going to say. I'm like, but that's status yeah. quo. Yeah. <laughs> and then they so also that's... had a little more, didn't they? Um... Well, I mean, I was really, uh, what I'm getting at is they announced that they've sold 105 million copies worldwide. And Psyonix has pretty much came out and said, yeah, we're not planning a sequel. This is the game. Nice. Yeah. So, so in- instead of iterating on a new version and starting over, they're just going to keep updating Rocket League, keep optimizing it, keep adding new things. And I really, really hope that their DLC packages and the stuff like RLCS uh, will sustain them monetarily. Because if this yeah. is the game, if they're not releasing any sequels or anything like that, they have to find a way to sustain their development costs. And they yes. will, but you have to remember, uh, they're a small shop. They may have spun up a few extra devs to get the game out, but that had to be contracting. That's flexible wage. I would hope so. They probably have no more than 10 developers on staff, I would say. And they got keys, they have DLC, they still have game sales going on. I mean, they just hit 105 million sales. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So uh, that- there's actually, somebody made a little documentary. Um, uh, the the channel is called No Clip on YouTube. And he talked with the developers and they kind of explained the story behind the, the um, behind Psyonix and then the development of Rocket League and all this stuff. It's, it's really interesting. If you get a chance, take uh, definitely watch that. Yeah, I'm... I'll probably have to take a look because I'm. Yeah. I really, really enjoy it, and I honestly, I love the idea of them saying we're doubling down on this, and we're not mm-hmm. trying to migrate our player base and risk losing them. Yeah, this is right. pretty huge for a game developer to say, "Hey, uh, you know all those sequels everyone's doing all the time? Yeah, we're not going to do that. That's that's not a thing, by it, the way." It's promising the destiny. Now let's hope they actually do, and not what destiny does. Right. Right. Uh, Silex has has got some balls. To, to pull this, it's it's really nice to see. It's Man. it's very much unlike, uh, you know, someone like Konami, for instance. <laughs> I just would have said Bungie, easy one there. But um, yeah. And for those who like to stream Rocket League, uh, Twitch is releasing or has released the beta of their desktop app. Um, yeah. So this is kind of weird. Uh, Twitch is starting to play in grounds that they've never played in. So this desktop app is going to help handle streaming. It's going to be kind of a social hub in the form of Discord, where it's going to play voice servers. Mm. It is also going to have streaming abilities uh, into it. And also certain games will plug in through it that were purchased through Steam. Now, I've Mm. heard them talk on PAX where they're talking about... Did I say bought on Steam? Sorry. That were purchased on Switch or Twitch, the Twitch game uh, service. Yeah, Sorry. Twitch, that's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said that wrong. Sorry. Steam, Steaming but Switch Twitch. At their packs, they talked about the desire to work with publishers and that if publishers are willing to, they'll put publisher games on it as well, such as EA Origin games and Ubisoft Uplay games. So it sounds like they might be trying to position themselves to expand this to potentially be a Steam-esque shop, which I think would be great. I, I agree that Steam needs more competition. This this marketplace needs, absolutely needs more generalized competition. And uh, you play in Origin, I don't think count, 
because they're publisher based. Yeah, they're they're publisher shops, and everyone hates Uplay, so that doesn't really count. And everyone's basically forced to use Origin for stuff like Titanfall or Mass Effect, and so that that doesn't really count because most people that use Origin don't do so willingly. They would absolutely buy it on Steam if they had the option. Um, but I, I think this is interesting. My big fear is that people will buy games using Twitch, and then in two years they'll say, yeah, that was a cool experiment. It didn't really work out. Uh, we're dropping it. And now that's, that site gets shuttered. It's, it won't kill Twitch as a whole, obviously, but that functionality will be gone. But you still have the games. Keep in mind, you can buy games through Twitch right now before right. all this so right. it's not like you'd lose your games but will it be mm -hmm. like steam shutting down right because if steam shuts down we're all fucked if if twitch shuts down and you've got a huge library on on twitch games are you fucked does it move did they give you keys for other platforms well, keep, well, it's implementation details but it's important implementation details well that's what i'm saying you have the game you already have the game with twitch there is no key okay. there is no you have the game so so it wouldn't completely emulate a steam store you could just buy it with them as a gateway drug, essentially. And it would register that you have the game and then, or something like okay. that. I just think that having another developer or another group move into this space will allow for competition, which might give some new innovations that we haven't seen yet. It'll be, it'll be interesting. Yeah. And I, I definitely think I love Steam. I absolutely adore Valve. Uh, yeah. But Steam needs competition uh, because they, I don't want to say they've rested on their laurels because they absolutely haven't. Um, you know, the big picture update, all the in-home streaming stuff, the Steam Link, the Steam Controller, which has gotten mixed reviews. You know, they, they are trying new things with the platform as a whole, but nothing gets you moving faster than someone chomping at your heels, monetarily yeah. speaking. Um. We do have uh, some news uh, coming to us from Polygon and a host of other places that uh, the Nintendo Switch should be back in stock at GameStop next week, uh, along with several other retailers is what it looks like. Um, the it, A GameStop representative told Polygon that at this point the company will only be selling the additional Switch units in physical stores and not online. Um, mm. So you should visit your nearest GameStop store for availability details. Yes, um, wave two of the Nintendo questionable distribution has been launched. Yeah. Yes. So we'll we'll <laughs> see. It's um, it'll be interesting. Nintendo has basically doubled down on Switch production and literally doubled down on it. They said they're doubling Switch production, which is great. Um, apparently, this thing sold better than their wildest expectations. Uh, it's. <laughs> It's broken some records. Um, it looks to be receiving pretty decent reviews. Even with the small issues that the Switch does have, it hasn't been enough yeah. to damper sales. I'm buying one, and I swore not to until Christmas. So, <laughs> so the just power of Zelda. So the power of snipper clips. Keep an ear out. Um, if you find one, I would say get it if you already have something else to play games on. It's not a primary, but it's a beautiful secondary. And, and if you find one and I don't have one yet, tell me and I will go drive to your place and I will, I will buy it. And not kill you and steal it. Promise. And the last little bit of news we have is related to Mass Effect. More like Ass Effect. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, yeah. so um, for those unaware, uh, the embargo is lifted and the <clears throat> reviewers are talking about the game because the game comes out next week. <laughs> um, it sounds like the beginning of the game has some rough spots, we'll say, where the animations are highly questionable and the, the big moments of mass, I shouldn't say big, it's not the right word, big parts of Mass Effect are the dialogue wheels, the choice in how you interact with people. These parts have some of the worst lip sync, glitchy character movements I have ever seen in a recent game. Oh, it's not even just lip movements. There is an entire cutscene where one of the characters enters the default development character model T pose for the entirety of the cutscene. The entirety of this character model is in the scene. It is in a T pose and it is talking like this, staring straight ahead. 
It is <laughs> fucking amazing. There's a pretty famous clip of the one of the characters in a cutscene shooting a robot that appears behind someone, and the gun is backwards. She is shooting <laughs> herself. And oh, it's pure comedy. Something oh to keep in God. mind about this is this is a review copy. This isn't a test copy. This is the game that's going yeah. to go out to customers. Ugh. EA has Whoops. said the day one patch will absolutely not fix these animation issues. Ooh. The, uh, the stuff is being, I mean, the animation here is being compared to gorillas. Uh, it's being compared to this cool animated penguin guy. There's some really just awful uncanny valley shit that's hitting this game i don't know what happened here if if somehow they like bombed their version control repo back to the stone age and and accidentally <laughs> like uploaded an alpha quality build of the game or what but this is that's not good yeah this as someone put it uh online you know they've this is the stuff that people in Source Filmmaker would get absolutely blasted for and wouldn't yeah. even make you know the top 10 on Reddit with this shit. It is <laughs> fucking atrocious. Uh, I will source all their animation to a, a studio they've never heard of and it, it was nice and cheap. <laughs> it doesn't even look that good. To be honest, yeah. this, this looks like it just was never finished. Like these are these are half-baked trial animations of yeah well and this is the part where this person will come in and say some bullshit but you know they're not animated because the game's not finished and someone just cut a review copy and said yeah we're done now I, it just it is incredibly bad I, I've never seen shit like this this is amazing so one thing I will throw out there the reviewers are saying after you get through the first couple hours this does improve this is not a permanent thing so you at least have the understanding of the game will get better. It still is immersive. It is still a very fun game to play. But for the love of God, they have littered the beginning of this game with terrible animation sequences. Oh, this is this is amazing. Like there there are people like like gorilla marching through cutscenes or doing like the Monty Python, you know, crazy Ministry of Silly Walks shit all throughout these cutscenes. It is awesome. Uh, and there are there are several articles, there are several gifs and, and several tweets of just shit that's amazing. The the T pose one really got me. There is no <laughs> reason to have any character model in any game in a default T pose because that just means there's no animation there. Yeah, it's it's pretty glaring. It's one of those things where I don't care what the function of the game is. This is core stuff that you should not be fucking yeah. up. Oh my Especially god! Especially a giant AAA title like that. If oh, it's an indie, indie developed thing, or you know, a small little developer or something. Sure, but like this huge AAA anticipated game of a renowned series. Yeah, and especially as much hype as this game's been getting, for this to happen, it's. I mean, the game's, still gonna pl the game's still going to play well. I mean, that's not a question. Yeah. It's still just the delivery is just bad. I I was really hoping because I, I am a huge Mass Effect fan. I've probably put over 200 hours into the series playing through them multiple times. And I had high hopes for Andromeda, tempered high hopes because I knew it's... It's Mass Effect. It's the first, it, not a reboot necessarily, but the first game in a totally new story arc. There's no way it can be as good as the highest moments in 2 were, which is definitely the peak of the series. Um, but this shows a level of laziness that I was not mentally prepared for. So I'm, we're, we're going to do this live on air. I'm going to show, show Irk this. I mean, look at this cutscene. This is the cutscene where that character model is in a T pose. And yeah. cutscene cut is, is happening. People, other people are animated, and that character is literally just teed out, staring straight forward, and her mouth is moving, so at least they've got facial animations there. Yeah, that's. What the hell, EA? That is. What's the unholy hell? That's just terrible. This is amazing. Like, at this point, I'm not even mad. <laughs> I'm just impressed. Yeah, it's. We'll see next week when it comes out. Like I said, I'm sure the game will still do decent, but mm -hmm. it's eh. 
So, I'd like to know, with your Switch, what will you be playing in this upcoming week? Do you have an idea of what you'll be playing? So, I'll definitely be streaming some Zelda this weekend like normal. So, anyone interested in seeing some Breath of the Wild, um, odds are when I'm on stream, I try to strict to just shrine hunting so you don't see storyline. But uh, Sunday, probably given around 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time AM, you can probably come onto our Twitch and catch some Breath of the Wild. Other than that, I'll just be playing Breath of the Wild and streaming it through the week. And um, I'm sure you'll jump on around 8 or anytime around 11 p.m. Eastern Standard and see some Rocket League on the channel. I think uh, I will definitely be streaming some Dark Souls 2. Uh, in my, I've upgraded Tom Sucks at Dark Souls to Tom Sucks at Dark Souls 2. Um, where I will suck even harder, twice as hard, uh, specifically. <laughs> um, and I'm actually going to try to stream up some Stardew Valley. Everyone nice. has been telling me, for the love of God, play some Stardew Valley, get your farm on. Uh, and I've been putting it off, but I might start it on the plane ride home. We'll have to see. Um, it, it's got me intrigued, and I'm going to need some some nice, chill gaming to get me, you know, brought down from my Dark Souls hype. What about you, Adam? You plan on jumping on anything this week? Yes, I definitely plan on playing some more Resident Evil 7. Had a couple of day break from it, so I'm ready to delve back into it. And then Wednesday, when that Rocket League update hits, you better believe I'll be playing that. Actually, I, yeah. I will be streaming it as well, probably on Wednesday. Um, hopefully, if the, if the update is early enough. I usually play between like 4 and 8 p.m. Eastern, so definitely some Rocket League this week at some point. Yes, there will be ample amount of Rocket League in the evenings on our channel, so anytime you want to come check us out, you can come over to our Twitch at twitch.tv slash 72 pin connector see what we're up to. Um, in the event that you want to check out some of our other content, though, you can always find us on our uh, YouTube at 72 pin connector. Uh, you'll find us have some game reviews and some other odd and in unboxings and such in all of our podcasts we've done. If you want to let us know how we've been doing, you can tweet at us at, at 72 pin connector, or you could even send us some fan mail at fanmail at 72 pin connector.com. And for that, I think that's all we have for you this week. So until next time, game on. See you, everyone. Game on. Bye.